All right, it's eight o'clock. Thank you for all being here. We're going to get going and get started on this webinar. I'm Gary Schnitke from the University of Illinois in the Department of Ag and Consumer Economics, and we appreciate your attendance here to, today to this webinar. As the title title um, imp talks about, we're going to be talking about outlook for grain farm income in 2016 and 2017. This uh, this webinar is going to take a, a Illinois Midwest grain grain focus. So we're going to go over corn and soybeans, and then look at preliminary projections for 2016, and then moving on into looking at 2017. For 2017, we're using that outlook to begin to think about where what should be happening to cash rents. Um, the the uh, the short answer right now is grain farm income likely in 2016 is going to look a lot like 2015, which was low, and we expect that to continue into 2017. So we're still looking at v lower incomes downward pressure on non-line cost and downward pressure on cash rents. So that's that's the general message and now we'll go through that and discuss that. A lot of the material that will be used in this presentation is also available in the farm um, or management section of FarmDoc. You see the website here on the on the right hand side of the screen. We'll be making use of crop budgets here in this presentation as well as a publication called Actual and Projected Cost. Both of those are in our handbook chapter, which is at the bottom. Here you see our Illinois crop budgets. This is the 2016 budget, so you can get those from, 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 from our website. We will be releasing 2017 budgets next week, so look for that here on our farm management uh, section next week. Again, we're going to look at income, grain farm income for this coming year and put that against the backdrop. And obviously prices have a lot lot to do with where, we're, where our income is, is looking at. This um, slide, you're again looking at corn prices in the United States. These are monthly corn prices. And again, I'm going to just point out two things here. We had a relatively long period from 1975 through 2007 when corn prices varied around 240, 237 with the actual average, but 240. Sometimes we were well above it, like in 1995. Sometimes we were well below it, like in 1997 through 2003, where we had corn prices well below that. Now there is good reason to believe that we've reached a higher equilibrium or long run level and that's still where that might be at is, is a good question. It's averaged about – four. it has averaged 467 corn prices since 2006 through 2016. Um, is that the long run average, or is it a little bit lower than that? Maybe 430, 440. We we don't we don't we don't know. But there's there's pretty good evidence that that we are in a in a in a new higher corn price scenario compared to this period. But we are going to have periods where we're well below that average, and we've been below that 467 average since the fall of 2013. Since since then, we've had corn prices below four dollars, and that has that's that below four dollar price in the three fifty or maybe even lower three twenty range, um, um, is is likely to continue throughout the to twenty sixteen and through twenty seventeen. If you're looking at this period, this looks to me a lot like the period back here in the late nineteen nineties, early two thousands. We came off a high caused by short crops someplace, and then we stood down here as we had had low, low, uh, good crops around the world. We seem to be there right now. We, as far as crop outlook, we're we're dramatically different than where we were at the beginning of the summer. This just shows the December 2016 prices on the December 2016 corn contract. High, low, close. You can see back here in June, which now seems a long time ago, 
we were in the 430, 440 range, somewhere n near where we would think the long run price was going to be a little bit below it because this is a futures price and, and we're looking at cash prices. And then we saw those corn prices tumble and keep coming down. And now we're trading in the 320, 330, 30 range on that December corn contract. So between we a dollar fell off of that 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 contract be, between the mid to end of June till now, and the big thing that happened is is that here back in June we thought maybe we were going to have a short crop. Turns out it doesn't look like that's going to happen, and instead what what's what's happening is is that we're projected to have much higher corn production in both corn and soybeans. In 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 2016, uh, corn production is pr projected at something over 15 billion bushels. You can see right here, something 15.2 billion bushels, well above where we at, and what would be a record production in the United States. Similarly, with soybeans, we're at four point four point something uh, billion bushels. Again, a record. So if we're looking at record record production and 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 out and stocks going up as was covered by Daryl Good and Scott Irwin on their last last webinar, it's going to put downward pressure on prices and those large productions um, is leading and is a contributing factor to the lower prices that we're looking at right now. Given that. Here's sort of where we're, we're at for market year average prices and forecast. And this is a market year average for corn and soybeans. This, the, the ones you see in the boxes are what, but what USDA would be using, uh, 370, um, 370 for 2014. And, and they're coming out with a projection of 310 for 2016 and 910 for soybeans. So USDA is saying for the crop produced in 2016, something um, 310, 910. If you look at fall delivery bids here in, this, in central Illinois, it was 920 and 930. Whether that's what, 320 and, and 930, something, something pretty similar, a little bit higher, but similar to the, those long run prices. Um, so if anything, we're looking at lower prices in 2016 than we were looking in 2015. So prices coming down, but there's reasonable expectation that yields will be higher in 2016. So we have these lower prices, but 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 yields could be higher, at least on many Illinois farms, maybe less of a chance of that as you go east in Indiana, Ohio, and um, pretty good chance above average yields in the western corn belt as well. All right, so so we'll have have higher yields and that will counter some some of those lower 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 prices. The other thing that will be happening this fall will be that we will be many farmers and landowners will be getting um um uh, our county payment this is showing our estimates of the 2015 ARC County payment for counties in the United States. This is the 2015 payment. So this will be the 2015 payment, and that will be received in the fall of this year. Much of Illinois and in northern Illinois counties will have be, be having payments of over $80 per base acre. Um, most of Illinois counties will be in the sixty to eighty dollar range. Some lower. We have Piatt County here that's zero, just because it had exceptionally high yields. But most of most 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 counties will be receiving some, some payment on 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 corn. And you can see that that that's pretty constant in the eastern Corn Belt, where most will be receiving payments. Less so in Iowa, particularly in the lower portions portions of. Uh, Lower tier county of Iowa won't be receiving any any payments. That's corn. That's 2015 payment coming into uh, that will be received this fall. And there's a good chance that many counties will be receiving a soybean payment as well. Particularly in Illinois, northern Illinois, and and you in in much of central western central Illinois will be receiving payments. 
Indiana, Ohio are likely to receive payments as well, and again, less likely in Iowa and Minnesota. Those uh, payments will be res- Will, will will provide a needed cash flow this 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 fall. So those this fall those payments will be um, uh, will be received and and provide uh, some some cash flow, which will be important in 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 this year. So that is 2015 payment received in 2016. Now let's look forward at the 2016 payment, which will be received in the fall of 2017. And I'm just going to give you a feel for what those could be. This is our ARC County tool, and you can download that. It's a fast spreadsheet that's available on our on our website. This happens to be for McLean County. So these are the county yields for McLean County. Market year average prices for McLean County, and we estimate the ARC County payments over here. So in 2014, there wasn't a payment. We're estimating for 2015, again, the payment that would be received this fall for corn at $60. So let's come in here for 2016. If we have a 218 bushel yield, and I selected the 218 bushel yield just to match the highest in 2014. So if we have roughly a comparable year 2014 and into 2016, 320 market year average price, there would be something in the 40, 40 to $50 an acre payment. Again, that, the, that payment, the way this works, would go down if this market year average price for 2016 goes down. That's the, that's the price that we saw in that previous slide. So, but there is reasonably good chances of, 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 of our county payments for corn uh, for 2016. It will likely be less than the 2015 payment. And moving on into 2017, and I just stuck in here at 189 trend line yield, we're going to be back at higher market year average prices, let's say, for 2017. We're looking at much lower payments. And, 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 and for 2017, as we're budgeting for 2017, it's probably best to be building a $0 value in for Art County payments. Again, this is a 2017 payment here. That would be re- actually received in the fall of 2018. But if you're you're budgeting particularly for cash or for cash rent decisions or determining what can be paid for land, this is the this is the payment that would be associated with 2017 production. Again, 2016, we're probably looking at this coming down from from 2020, 20, 2015 and a further reduction into 2017, but likely still some payments for 2016. Again, that's going to vary across across counties. There could be quite a few counties that have zero payments if they have very high yields. And again, some counties that, particularly those in the eastern Corn Belt, Ohio, Indiana, where we're looking at much lower yields, they could have much higher payments because their yields will be lower. But anyway, here... If we're, we're, we're thinking about our county payments for 2016 and building that into income, we should, in most cases, be building less our county payments in for 2016 than 2015. And 20, going on into 2017, they'll probably be uh, gone by, by, by that point in time. So let's sort of combine those. This, this, is, this is a section on uh, – on, on, available in our, uh, our management section. And I'm just going to look here at this 2016 column and make a gross revenue projection. This happens to be for corn. So let's just build in here for corn, 2016, a yield the same as 2014, which may be, <laughs> may be optimistic, may not be, but, but in any case, we're looking at very, very, very good yields. So I just stuck in. 2016 same yield as for 2014. 320 price. <clears throat> Again, if this, by the way, if this number comes down, this price could go up, but they're going to be sort of offsetting at this point in, point in time if we have, if we're confirmed that we don't have as large a crop as we might anticipate. There, there would probably be a price response up. 
this would come down, so that, but that would sort of wash out. In any case, 231 yield, 320 price. You're looking at corn revenue at $739 per acre. And that is down from last year, and it's down. It, 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 the only it be back to 2009 levels. Our county payments were lowering them again. I am putting in here 2016 payments, which will be received in 2017. So this 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 is assuming that you're sort of accruing that payment on your income statement. Gross revenue for corn 774 which is down about $75 from last year, 70 to $75. So we're, even with higher prices, the joint impacts of higher prices and lower yields and our county payments coming down, we are looking at lower revenues. We also stuck in here $10 of crop insurance payments. This is sort of looking at an average, thinking that, you know, we had some in 2014, we're likely to have some in here in 2016. That's corn. Similar analysis for soybeans. Um, keep 65 bushels soybeans, 905 for the price. We're looking at, at a little bit less revenue in soybeans. In this, in, in this case, the primary reason is 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 because of uh, because of lower 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 arc lower arc arc payments. In any case. On a per acre basis, 2016, even given high in, high yields, we're probably looking at lower revenue in 20, 2016 than we were in 2015. Um, so the that the impact of that would be obviously lower incomes for for 20, 20, 20, um, 2016. Somewhat <laughs> countering that, though, will be likely reductions in non-line cost. We have built in uh, reductions in non-line cost into our 2016 projections, and um, there, those, those costs are, cost are significant for both corn and soybeans. The primary cost that we're putting in there that has declined is fertilizer. Fertilizer prices are lower for 2016 than they were in 2015. We've built also built in slight declines in machinery depreciation, and we've also built in some slight declines in in in, in other items as well. But the major reason why 2016 costs are projected <coughs> lower than 2015 costs are because of lower 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 fertilizer fertilizer prices. So. Um, Given that, so so we have lower revenues. We also have lower 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 cost. Here's sort of where we come out with with those differences. Again, we're we're looking at that we're projecting those 2016 costs to be down for for both corn and soybeans. Forty seven dollars for corn. Sixteen dollars for soybeans, which is a pretty sizable decline in cost that you're looking looking at over time. All right, revenues down, costs are down. Here's sort of the the uh, the bottom line, so to speak. And this the, these bars here, this blue bar, is operator and land return. So that that would be gross revenue. Minus non-line cost. It doesn't include any, any, any cost for um, or charge for the land. If it's cash rent land, it would be the cash rent. As you can see, here we were we we our golden age in agriculture. We had pretty high operator and land returns, and those have been coming down. 2013, 2014, 2015. And actually, 2016 and 27, we are projecting lower operator and land returns than in 2015. Again, gross revenue is coming down more than our non-line cost. That happened because right now we're projecting prices in the lower $3 range for corn. And 
and and that that's countering um, the price or the yield increases that we saw. This is cash rent, average cash rent here, and we'll we'll come back to that here in in, in a minute. But cash rents have been coming coming down as well. But you can see here the. Those cash rents coming down into 2016, we're still in a in a low low income low income situation here, and 2016 is now shaping up to be something very similar to 2015. Could be actually a little bit worse if we have continue to have prices 310 320 on corn. Maybe about the same if we get corn prices back to 350, 360. Again, we need prices in those ranges because of of our county payments coming down. So, looking at that, here is what net income on grain farms have done since 1996. This is from FBFM. So these are FBFM FBFM uh, averages. Um, average per farm. So this is an average of all farms in Illinois that are grain farms that are enrolled in Illinois FBFM. Um, rough size, 1,500 acres, about 20% of their acres owned, uh, roughly split between cash rent and share rent. And um, corn, soybeans, the predominant crop. Again, it varies across the state. So we have southern, northern, and central Illinois farms here. Again, back here in that 1988, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002 period, we were sort of averaging $40,000 per farm. 2006, we saw commodity prices go up and we saw higher farm incomes. 2009, lower again because of lower prices and some high cost. And we had some good income years, 2012 being the high. And then from that 2012 coming down, um, 2013, 2014, $120,000 of income roughly in the 2013, 105 in 2014. For grain farms, roughly $5,000 of grain farm income in 2015. So very low in 2015, below those 99 through 2002 averages. So... We're back to that below that period. And that actually, if you could, is likely to be one of the lowest incomes and probably even lower than what we saw in the, the 1980s. All right. Given what you saw before, if we're looking at 2016, um, we still, prices are, are obviously uncertain. But if we have, with exceptional yields, and exceptional are, you know, right now USDA is forecasting the, 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 the Illinois corn yield at 200 bushels per acre, roughly the same as in 2014 or is the same as in 2014. And if we got prices of 350 for corn, 950 for soybeans, we would have roughly the same income in 2016 as 2015. That assumes that their cost cuts have occurred. We have we have co cut cost to have that same income. If we're looking at three twenty corn, nine dollar soybeans, it would be lower and would be would be negative at that at that level. Other thing I would point out is that that in Illinois we are projecting a, a, a exceptional yields. I would guess you would would say that two hundred bushel or. There will be many farms with maybe good yields, above average yields, but not at the high, the highest of the high, I guess. They could also have lower incomes because they simply don't have as, as much, uh, much, 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 much uh, bushels to sell. At this point, you would be saying 2016, the income looks about the same as last year, maybe a little bit lower given where prices are at now. And again, that's built on, on good yields, very high yields, um, our county payments coming down, and there has to be, 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 be some cost cuts. So we're still, 
um, bumping along here at the at, at a low income, and that will cons, con, in, go on in in 2016. So now let's turn to 2017. Okay, so 2016 we're probably at low or we're at low incomes. Um, now let's turn to 2017. What we're going to do here is look when I'm, we're making 2017 projections, we're going to look at trend line yields, or we're going to look at tr not at a, as at high yields as we had in 2016, but back back to more normal levels. We're going to use a 350 corn price and nine dollar soybean price in these projections. That's pretty close to the fall 2017 delivery prices right now. And if you look at futures contracts. On, on Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, contracts, we would be looking at something, something, something similar to that. We're going to look at non-line costs decreasing twenty-seven dollars per acre for corn and a similar amount for soybeans. That's based on still fertilizer costs coming down and some reduction in seed cost, and cash rents. Uh, come down aggressively, and I say aggressively come down because we've never seen a $23 decrease in, in cash rents. Um, we've never been in a period like this before, but that the rents coming down that much would, would, be a, would be a large amount. If we do that, put that into our budgets, here's what those budgets look like. This is this is high productivity land, two hundred bushels corn, three fifty price, seven hundred dollars worth of revenue, and put a zero arc payment for twenty seventeen. So, saying that arc county will be gone for twenty seventeen production, two hundred bushel, three fifty price. We're looking at gross revenue seven hundred dollars for corn, five seventy six for soybeans. Direct cost coming down. Again, primarily because of lower fertilizer prices. Uh, last report we've seen suggests that anhydrous ammonia prices now are at $500 per ton. So that's build, building into those costs. Power costs coming down, overhead costs coming down, non-line costs still coming down. Our operator and land returned at $180 for corn, $245 cash rent. Again, that would be down, down from... Uh, from this year's levels, and we're still looking at negative for corn, positive for soybeans, and the average being negative. One point here, obviously we're, we're looking at negatives again. Um, corn would be in this case projected to be less profitable than soybeans. If you're looking at those graphs, um, th that would be the – uh, and if that happens, in 2013, soybeans were more profitable than corn. Same in 2014, 2015. We're projecting it for 2016 and now seven, 2017 projection. So that would be five years in a row where corn is less less profitable than soybeans. So we're we're continuing that 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 projection. Given that, here's. 2016 and here's 2017. Here we're bringing cash rents down, so this would be cash rents coming down to 245. Again, you're looking. If all of those things happen, uh, we would still be looking at, at at low incomes for 2017, and actually, obviously, that 245 dollar cash rent, and this green line is is the cash rent here. Um, we would be looking at something, some, something that that isn't profitable at the at at the average cash rents. So right now, you're looking at 2017 shaping up. Given 350 corn, nine nine uh, fifty soybeans being about the same as 2015, 2016, and 2017 from a profitability standpoint. That presumes that there are significant cost cuts being made on farms, that those costs are coming down um, 
again, we're looking at at, at, at revenues being 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 um, being fair, 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 fairly fairly low here. Or at least much lower than they were in the 2010, 2011, 2012, 2012 period. So, all right. So, one of the, the one of the central questions. So we're building in 350 corn, nine dollar soybeans. How long will prices be at these levels, or will be at these lower levels? 350, nine, three each corn. And that's a, and again, we sort of, or I, I subscribe to the idea that the long run price is probably in the 420, 430 range, but we could spend many, many, many years down below that, 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 pr, that 420, 430 price. The likely answer of how long we'll be here is till we have a short crop someplace in the world. Maybe here, maybe South America, but we need some short crop someplace to to <clears throat> reduce supplies of of grains. When will that happen? It, that that is un, unpredictable. It could be next year. We could have a short crop here in in the United States next year, and that would tend to raise prices. Um, we we might not. We could have another. A uh, good year, we could have, as Scott Irwin and Daryl Good have written elsewhere. We this year's above trend yield uh, um, uh, projection could be larger. Actually, this wasn't a record trend uh, above year trend, but we could be down here next year, with year after, or several several years years down the road. So it's it, we could be. There's there there is no guarantee that we get out of this next year or the year <laughs> after. Someday we will, but we could be at these prices for for a while. If we get higher prices, and I, I showed a budget before with four, um, three fifty corn, nine dollars soybeans. Here is what those budgets would look like if we had four dollar corn and nine fifty soybeans. And then farmer return would be closer, would be positive, and thirty nine dollars per acre. So this four dollar, um, four dollar level is where we begin to think about <clears throat> there being some stability out there for for farmers as far as their income situation. That has built into that this though that four dollar sort of price. That we've made all of these cost cuts, and that cash rents have 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 come down. So, those cash rents ha have come down. In if we we're thinking about that being being uh, four dollar corn being a, a stable place, if we get to this longer run price four thirty to ten to ten four thirty corn ten thirty soybeans. Um, we would have positive farmer returns and 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 in the ninety five dollar and dollar an acre range, so you know just just the differences in those prices of if we do when we do get back to that four thirty to ten thirty corn we will be in a in a reasonably reasonably good income situation, but we will could be below those for several years yet we've been down below those for since 2013 already. All right. So that leads us to more some of our cash rent decisions and some of our uh, decisions on, on making, making cost cuts. And where we're at is many farmers have uh, cash rents that won't work at 350 corn and $9 soybean prices. If you put a budget together, if you put a budget together, even given where we're at average cash rent wise, it won't work. So what well, what are we going to do? One of the first questions I would suggest asking is, if you do a budget, would it would you would the farm be profitable at 430 corn and 1030 soybean prices? Put those in the budget. Is the farmer return positive at that point in time? If it isn't, well, there's not 
there's there's it's not likely that that farm will be will will be will, will ever be profitable. And at that point, either the cash rent has to come down, or you know, it's that that farm isn't contributing to the financial stability of that operation. It might be time to get get rid of that farm. If if it does work at those prices, then the next question is, how long can you stand 350 corn prices? And can you can you take the losses that are likely to happen as long as we have 350 corn? Again, that's maybe we'll get there in 2016, maybe not, but we're still looking at, at, at lower corn lower corn prices. Can we do this for two, three, four years? And is it really worth 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 the risk of risk of doing that? Do, doing that at this point in time? Excuse me. We're 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 at this point where we're still looking at the at needing those costs come cost to come down. Here just gives you a feel for what has been happening on the big three non-land cost: seed, fertilizer, and pesticides. And cash rents, um, this this goes up to 2015, and they have been coming down. One one of the nice things that we have been seeing is is that fertilizer co- prices costs have come down, cash rents have come down, seed costs have not up to this point much, but we have seen those non-line costs and cash rents, or at least the average levels average levels come down. So we're going to have to continue to see those those come down because we're now looking at lower prices than we probably anticipated. So those have those costs have to come come down more. Related to that is again the decision of planting corn and soybeans, and you know the last five years soybeans have been more profitable than corn. So maybe it is time to switch to more soybeans, particularly on corn on land that was. Traditionally, corn after corn. Um, why not switch it to switch it to soybeans? I would particularly look take a hard look at that if we don't see some non-line cost decline. Further non-line cost declines on on corn, and again, the most likely areas that you're going to see that is in seed cost or nitrogen fertilizer prices. Nitrogen fertilizer prices do. Do appear to be coming down, but we continue to need to see those 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 to come down as more to come down as more. So, the again, what we need is we're looking at those costs and we're thinking about that corn versus soybean decision. Is is what we have seen since two thousand is a pretty dramatic ri- rise in corn costs relative to soybean cost. That number, the difference between non-line cost and corn, was around sixty-three dollars in in two thousand, and it's grown over time. 2017, 2015, 2016, we're projecting that at two hundred dollars an acre. Again, that rise, particularly since two thousand thirteen, and then we had these lower prices, is why we're have, we're now seeing corn being less profitable than soybeans. We need to see those numbers come down if we want to see corn and soybeans have roughly the same pop profitability. Some of the things, again, that would likely need to come down are number of tillage passes, seed cost, and we have to see some sizable seed cost declines, and nitrogen fertilizer prices. Those are the big three that, that are different between corn and soybeans. Here is sort of a look at that. So if we're looking, this is this is this is 200 bushel land, 185 bushel land. If we're looking at a soybean price of nine dollars, we have to have a corn prices have to be above 388 for corn to be more profitable than soybeans, given a 200 dollar cost difference. 950 would be at 404, 10, 420. At this point in time, we're the, the projections for 2017 would be nine dollars for soybeans, 350 for corn. So again, that would be looking at sort of corn being less profitable than soybeans. Cash rents, cash rents have come down a little bit. 2016, 
In in Illinois, according to uh, according to USDA, cash rents were two twenty one in twenty sixteen, coming down seven dollars from the two hundred twenty eight dollar value in in twenty fifteen, and that was down from the high in in twenty fourteen of two hundred thirty four dollars. So we've been seeing average levels of cash rents decline, but we still have to see those being come, come down come down some more. Just to give you a feel, here's where we sort of look at expected corn yields, 200, 185, 163. This was sort of where the average cash rent was in 2015, 268, 230, 159. If you look at sort of a break-even cash rent for 2017, that would be where the farmer has zero return. It would be $200 and this is given three fifty corn, nine dollars soybeans, two hundred dollars per acre for, for for would be the break even cash rent. So that's considerably below where we're currently at. I use sort of two forty five in my budgets, which would still have the farmer having losses. We don't want to have the farmer having losses. It would be two hundred, two hundred and ten dollars an acre for two hundred bushel land. $185 for 180 bushel land, $100 for 163 bushel land. Again, we're a long way from those levels, um, and that would be a sizable cut. Again, um, those are based on 350 corn, $9 soybeans, and we've had them for four years. We might as well think that they're going to persist a little while longer. Um, so we have – so. That's where these 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 prices are, are being being our cash rents are being driven. One of the things that as we're looking at lowering cash rents to to consider is a variable cash rent. Think about putting a variable cash rent in place with a lower base rent, maybe something in those range, and then have that uh, a bonus or additional rent if we have gross revenues ab ab above those. And we have some examples of those on, on farm doc. So for thinking about lowering, ca lowering cash rents, maybe going, going to a variable cash situation would be a, be a good, 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 good move at this point in time. Last week, the Illinois Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers released their expected rents for 2017. They all saw those. So this is their 2017 projected comparing to where they're at currently. They're projecting those rents to come down. Again, uh, Illinois society rents tend to be higher than the average. So they're, 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 they're projecting a decrease in, in, in rents as well. Um, those rents are still – they would still be at levels where farmers are unprofitable, given where where we're we're looking at uh, price wise for 2017 right now. This is average cash rents in 2014. We will have an updated map. They didn't release these in 2015. We will have an updated map in 2016. But there, there, the, those rents obviously vary around the state. Some of our higher cash rents are in central Illinois. And we'll see what the the and, and it's very much related to the land productivity, and we'll see what that looks like for the for this for this coming year. So we are going to see downward pressure on cash rents again. If you're a landowner, you can expect a farmer to be asking for reductions in cash rents this coming year. How you feel about that's a a, a good question. Um, it's obviously not 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 something that's desirable. One of the questions that often comes up, and we we didn't particularly aren't going to spend a lot of time on land prices on on this on this 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 discussion. We have seen softening in land prices, you know, coming down. Um, Eight to ten percent across the state. Uh, Illinois Society released theirs and said that that land prices have have come down. 
I would personally anticipate that land prices would come down in the face of lowering cash rents. So these cash rents are going to come down. As cash rents come down, farmer returns of land come down. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that we are at historically low interest rates. And you can listen to the Fed and others say what's happening to interest rates. My guess is we'll have continue to have historically low interest rates. So we will likely see land price declines, but those historically low interest rates are likely keep going to keep land not decreasing as much as maybe you would anticipate. If cash rents go down 10, 15 percent, you could you can you could anticipate land prices going 10 to 15 percent. Um, but again, those low land land prices are keeping um, keeping us in a situation where where those are supporting land prices. And you have to ask yourself a question: If I sell farmland, where would I put the money? And if I if I don't need need the funds right now for consumption or other items, where would I invest it and get a similar return to land? Do I view the stock market as being a safer investment than land? And that's that's your that that's anybody's guess, I guess. But just just but just treasury rates have been coming down. The current return is stated as a percent of farmland is roughly is actually a little bit higher right now than the than the, the than those treasury treasury rates. You often hear I need a cash rent that's equal to four percent of the land price. One, you're not going to get it, and you one the other point is that you can't get that on another investment, so you probably have to lower that 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 percentage. So, land prices we're looking at very low interest rates and land price declines likely matching the percent decreases on cash rents. Summarize here. Appreciate you this. this Sitting through this, we are likely looking at continued low incomes in 2016. And I would guess at this point in time, you would say that there's continued low returns in 2017. And you would anticipate continued low returns even after um, cost cuts and cash rents. And that's going to put more – so we're going to have to have C, cost cuts and cash rents decline to see continued low returns. Um, so those non-line costs and cash rents must continue to decline and farmers are going to have to think about planting more soybeans. Again, that's been more profitable than corn. Lowering all cost and, and lowering cash rents. So I guess I would say that after the summer, we saw a bumper crop come in and that did not help our financial situation much. <laughs> so there, there, there's where we're at and where we have a sub – you haven't – Dale's been sitting here quiet. What? <laughs> He's not going to say anything now, right? Well, you presented kind of a pretty pessimistic <laughs> view. I guess I try to think of the things that might happen that would offset that a little bit and obviously the, the higher yields this year for mm -hmm. 16 will offset some of these lower prices. There was some opportunity or there was an opportunity to price some grain mm -hmm. before prices dropped and there was some pricing of grain at four dollars or so or three eighty mm -hmm. or whatever. So that'll help a little bit. Um, and we do have some more variable cash rents out there than we've had in the past, which we'll adjust given the current conditions. So and hopefully with these lower prices we do see increase in demand. I know Gary and or uh, Daryl and Scott would discuss that more, but uh, hopefully there's some things that do turn around that we haven't built into this that may make things a little rosier than what you're painting <laughs> out there. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, it comes down to the high supply, uh, good yields, high supply, and lower prices. And, and again, a lot of situations, the, the, the increase in yields are going to offset the lower prices to some extent. Uh, and hopefully we're at the low end of these grain prices and we see some comeback um, as we move through the winter months and things like that and some opportunities to price grain a little higher than what we're looking at right now. But that maybe is a little bit of optimistic view on things. But hopefully there's not as gloomy as what it looks like out there, what you're painting right now. But uh, we understand the situation we're in. Yeah, so – and again, just looking at where the uh, those numbers are right now. We have a number of questions. 
Will the fifty to seventy five dollar per acre and payment on the twenty fifteen pro farm program change your recent view of cash rent picture? Um, so we're going to get a, tw a fifty to seventy five dollar payment on twenty fifteen, which actually if you goes to the 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 land the farmer if it's a cash rent situation it would go to the farmer who farmed it in 2015 i don't see that impacting cash rents much however it will be a nice cash flow to have this year that 50 to 75 dollars per acre is going to help out many 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 farm situations and 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 many farm situation if it, the next questions, if it is accepted that the climate is more volatile than in the past, is it not reasonable to assume short years will occur more frequently in the past? Can we run the numbers on this possibility? That's an interesting question. So you're saying that the climate, weather is more, more interesting. Is there a possibility of short crops um, more? And, and my answer to that would be you would expect that, I suppose, right? So, but sort of interesting we we've had except for 2014 we've had a really benign set of years here recently Daryl Good and Scott Irwin will likely be talking more about that at our farm income summit um, you're you are the, there is a you know a short crop year would dramatically change our pricing outlook and when though when that happens we will we will um, be looked be looking at uh, different prices and again back closer to profit or more profitability. You just mentioned some prices that have come down: tillage passes and input, then one or two more prices that need to come down or be reduced. All right, so costs that need to be, be reduced. Obviously, we're going to we're going to see machinery depreciation come down because capital purchases um, need are being reduced so machinery dep depreciation it, it will come down we've also seen fuel costs come down over the past several years unfortunately it's not that big of a cost on a farm so but it's still still helpful i would suggest farmers look at less tillage and simply as a way of conserving their machinery base making sure that those tillage passes do pay off in yields Fertilizer costs have come down, and we're likely looking again at lower fertilizer cost for 2017 than for 2016. Uh, nit nitrogen, last Illinois production cost report had nitrogen and hydrous ammonia at $500 per ton, uh, which was lower than it, uh, the five, high fives that we've been looking at. The, the question is then what happens to pesticides and, and seeds, um, looking at fungicides, um, making sure that those fungicide passes or treatments are needed. Unfortunately, on pesticides, we're probably looking if, at anything at higher cost because of weed resistance problems out there. And the question is what happens to seed cost and in particular to corn cost? If that doesn't come down appreciably, maybe looking more at more at soybeans. Um, can you discuss the impact of continued increases in farm real estate taxes on the light of the cash rent discussion? Yeah, that's a that's a. So we're seeing real estate taxes increase partly because of the way the ag valuation happens, and we'll begin to see ag valuations begin to come down as we factor in the recent years in which which which. Uh, Revenues are, are are lower, so those those ag valuations will will be coming down. Un, you know, this unfortunately that's a not a good good you know cash rents needing to come down and and property taxes going up aren't aren't a very attractive al alternative for a landowner, um, and it will be incre it it will be uh, decreasing. Decreasing their 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 return more. So, um, with 2017 forecast down, all right, net farm income down by 11 11 percent. 
what's 2017 impacts. So uh, USDA did impact did uh, th so I'm going to so USDA is forecasting net farm income in the U.S. down for this year. Um, when what will they be doing? Looking for 2017? That's a that that. That, that, that is a good question. A lot of that will we'll, we'll be looking at what's happening in the livestock sector, which we haven't looked at. Um, the grain sector, at least in corn and soybeans, probably isn't going to be contributing at this point. You wouldn't be attributing much of that to, to, a, to an increase. So um, good question, which I don't have a good answer to. It's <laughs> the long answer to that, short answer to that. What happens if interest rate interest go up to the cash rents? Would they increase or decrease or all else being equal? So let's say interest goes up. I, I don't see that as impacting cash rents as much as land values. So if interest rates go up, which would be something that most people – so most people would say – the Fed keeps talking about raising interest rates and they're, they're not talking about raising those interest rates much probably. But if we're talking, you know, one two percent increases or interest rates going up one to two percentage points, you would be looking at a pretty dramatic impact on land prices at that, at that point in time. Another question: How much does marketing in the top one third change profitability as opposed to an average marketing return? Is better marketing a key ingredient that the farmer can control? Um, Marketing in the top one third would be a would be a would would significantly increase profits. Unfortunately, it's very hard to do. <laughs> um, probably not something that most farmers. I mean, if you believe in rational markets, it, it would be 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 hard be be hard to do. And let's just take that the period back when we had four dollar corn here in June. At that point in time, it's, it's easy to say I should have marketed more of it. But at that point in time here, we were looking at dry, dry conditions and, and weather reports that were saying it could be a dry July. I mean, El Nino, La Nino, and we were looking at a lot dry, dry July. In hindsight, pricing everything then would have probably been a good, 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 good decision, but Hindsight's twenty twenty, and predicting weather isn't. Are your are your calculations based on conventional tillage? Actually, what we're looking at is an average of what's in FBFM farms, and that wouldn't be what I would term as conventional. It would be probably minimum tillage, predominantly. And again, farmers vary. Uh, a chisel tillage pass in the fall, and a field cultivator type pass in the spring would be what predominates in, in the, the, the numbers that I'm showing here. Another question, is there a difference in return between conventional till and no-till? Do FBFM records show a better income bias for, for one type of farm over other? We really haven't looked at that, so uh, I don't know the, know the answer to that. Well, we, when we look at those things, what we find is obviously no-till has an has a advantage on the power cost side. Um, but to achieve those power cost savings, you have to get rid of the machinery. So that's the the key to, key to those things <coughs> is uh, is is to uh, to to lo to get rid of the power equipment. Is it advisable to lock in land debt into long terms if it is currently financed on a short term variable rate? So. What do you think about that, Dale? <laughs> well, that question has come up a lot the last four or five years, given lower interest rate climate that we've been in. And, um, you know, <clears throat> we kind of say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea to do. And really, there hasn't been too much harm in not doing it. But as the Fed continues to look or talk about increasing rates, and we've had one increase so far, um, it's probably a good way of at least stabilizing what your cash which your debt payments are going to be down the road to help in budgeting and things like that. So I think as we talk about an increase in rates, and maybe that will actually happen some more, it's probably more uh, pertinent to look at that and uh, maybe go ahead and 
and uh, lock in some more, depending on where you're at and what your whole portfolio looks like, but go ahead and lock in some long-term rates uh, given the situation we're in. If nothing else, for just at least you're kind of fixing and knowing what your payments are going to be down the road. How much? What's the difference between a short? What's the interest rate spread now? I, no, I shouldn't have asked that. Yeah, yeah, I haven't looked at that recently. You know, long term, fifteen or twenty percent, twenty year rates are maybe in the fives or something, and you still could be three ish or something like that for variable rates. Yep, yep. Depending on you know, there's a number of options out there. Yep, yep. So. All right. When you show average pricing, are you taking into consideration selling at least 70 percent of projected? So when we're looking at average, the prices here, we we're looking at, at at what what I what what would be what what would typically be the case. So um, and and I we don't in the end. It gets washed out by what what farmers actually do out there. I would be surprised if they're marketing seventy percent of the projected yield before harvest. That'd be an unusual situation. You know, I think the prices you're using have been straightforward from the USDA yeah. midpoint prices, which you know most people have some marketed ahead at higher prices than that, but. But that, very few would have a very large percentage marketed at higher prices. And, and marketing ahead doesn't come into play into the market year average prices, too, because they, they're, they're, if you're forward contracting in particular. But even, all right, so yeah, there's a, another question about no till. But even if you keep the equipment while doing no till, you're not spending for fuel and labor, so shouldn't there be savings? And, and, and the answer to that is yes, there will be a, a no-till. Will be a, there will be a, a saving, savings to doing no-till. There will be a fuel savings and a labor savings. Um, ag again, getting the, uh, the, there's the other machinery depreciation and interest cost potentially that are st that still exist there if we don't get rid of the machinery. But you're right, fuel and labor w savings will will exist as w as well. We are coming to the end of our webinar. We appreciate your time today. Um, Dale thought I was pessimistic, so I probably was too pessimistic. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Well, hopefully I can say things <laughs> will be a little better than what we've talked about this morning and some yeah, things pop so, up that we're not aware of. Yeah, so hopefully things 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 will change. But if they don't, we're looking at lower lower prices and in a lower price environment, cost cutting and reduction in cash rents and these um, seed decisions continue to be important. Um we will thank you again for spending your time with us this morning. Enjoy the rest of your day as you go about your work. And again, thank you. And um, look at our Farm Doc Daily website for our other, our, for our articles and upcoming webinars as they become available. Again, thank you. <laughs>